Okay, good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce the third session of KaiPak at 20, where we will be exploring the extremes of our universe and the variable parts of our universe. However, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. We have Anna Ogajalek joining us from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, and Anna was a graduate student here, uh, working with Steve Allen and the XOC Group from 2014 to 2019, uh, before she went across to Maryland, where she has a joint appointment at Goddard and at the University of Maryland College Park, where her research is all about the role that feedback from supermassive black holes plays in galaxies and everything we can do with high resolution X-ray spectroscopy in terms of the outflows from black holes and also the gaseous halos around galaxies. And Anna will be telling us about that today um, in the context of high resolution X-ray spectroscopy with CRISM and beyond. So uh, take it away, Anna. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for uh, the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I really wish I could be here in person, but unfortunately that didn't work out. Um, to start the morning session, uh, I'll tell you about high resolution X-ray spectroscopy, which is entering its golden age as we speak. But before uh, I get into specifics, uh, let's first ask a question that may, may be on people's mind. Why should you care about X-rays? The way I like to think about um, it and astrophysical environments in general is in terms of temperature and density, since to a large extent, uh, these parameters govern the radiative processes that take place uh, in those environments to produce light. So when we think about X-rays classically, we think about very hot stuff in the millions to tens of millions of Kelvin. Well, this of course is true. X-rays are produced from environments at these temperatures, for example, galaxy clusters or immediate, immediate environments of black holes uh, for collisional, non-thermal and other processes. Uh, but this is not the whole story. X-rays can actually be produced through other processes, such as, for example, photoionization, charge exchange, or absorption from uh, or absorption uh, from environments that are orders of magnitude colder than one might think. So this opens up studies of many, many, many astrophysical environments, as listed here. So anything from dust, cold ISM, solar wind, atmospheres of planets, gaseous halos of galaxies places where stellar or AGN feedback uh, happen, or as the cosmologists were mentioning again yesterday, the nasty baryonic effects that are messing up their measurements. So this list is by no means exhaustive, but the takeaway here is that X-rays actually probe a massive range of astrophysical environments. And even more so for many cases, X-rays are the only probe or provide a completely unique physical insight that is inaccessible otherwise. And so you might be asking yourself now, wow, I didn't know this, but how come I haven't heard of the importance of X-rays in so many different fields of research? Well, this is because much of what I've talked about so far is can only be studied if we actually have specifically high resolution X-ray spectra. And this complicates things. So let's quickly, quickly look why. So we can map X-ray spectrographs by looking at the resolving power here on the y-axis over the x-ray band. And probably you already see that the numbers are typically lower than in other bands that signals that x-ray spectroscopy is hard. In orange, I show what the resolving power is needed roughly to measure line shifts of the order of 100 kilometers per second, provided high resolution data, high signal to noise data, which is basically the very least to start making interesting claims about, for example, gas dynamics. The gray line drawn here is the resulting power of a currently most common X-ray detector, a CCD. We immediately see that the typical X-ray CCD does not have sufficient energy resolution to gain interesting physical insight. Thankfully, a little over 20 years ago, first X-ray gratings were launched into space on board of the Chandra and XMM Newton spacecraft. Together, there are four X-ray gratings that are uh, currently in space. I want to stop here for a second and appreciate the subtle difference. We see that the slope of the resolving power function differs between the gratings and the CCD. So this is because gratings are wavelength resolving and CCDs are energy resolving detectors. It is interesting because actually X-ray regime is where this dual nature of light, the it is where the dual nature of light truly comes to life. And we can basically use 
the wave approach or the particle approach to uh, to detect the, the, the light. So we see that currently the high resolution detectors are dispersive wavelength resolving kind. Unfortunately, these kinds of detectors are fundamentally limited and let me explain why. So we all know from, we all know diffraction from physics classes. So for a point source, when we have photons of two different wavelengths, they will reflect off of the grating and hit the CCD detector in two different physical positions that correspond to their wavelengths. So the spatial location on the CCD tells us what the wavelength is. Let's now look at an extended source. The situation uh, is the same uh, if we consider a small region of the source. However, when, the cons when we consider photons that come from different parts of the source, we can end up on the CCD in the same place as photons from a different wavelength and location on the sky. And this is because X-ray gratings are slitless. So this means that the wavelength and spatial information are mixed. And let me illustrate this with some examples. So here we have a, a Chandra CCD image of a supernova remnant. But when dispersed, basically every emission line that's emitted by the supernova remnant creates its own image of the supernova. And these images overlap. So we can no longer precisely tell the photon wavelength based on its location, because it's either the location on the sky or the wavelength. Another example that's closer to home is Jupiter. Again, we're looking here at an X-ray image and we see the very bright polar regions. And now we see the XMM Newton dispersed spectrum. And we see that again, we get an image of Jupiter in individual lines. And especially those uh, bright polar regions stand out to us. And we can of course collapse this dispersed image into a 1D spectrum. And we see emission lines, but they are actually artificially broadened by the spatial extent of Jupiter. But neither supernova nor Jupiter have strong continuum emission, but many other sources like galaxies and galaxy clusters do, which makes using dispersive gra uh, gratings to do spectroscopy almost impossible. So coming back to our landscape of X-ray spectrographs, we see that we truly need an energy resolving spectrograph. So basically you can think of it as an X-ray IFU, where each pixel provides a high resolution spectrum. Well, this brings us to my PhD and specifically February of 2016, when HITOMI, a mission by JAXA and NASA was launched. So HITOMI carried uh, exactly what we needed, an X-ray microcarometer called SXS, uh, so a high resolution energy resolving detector into space. And this was actually a third attempt to launch this kind of instrument into orbit. The first one ended in rocket, rocket failure, and the second one, one, which was later known as Suzaku, had issues with interfaces, which made um, the microcarometer unusable. So how did um, the landscape of X-ray spectrographs look like in 2016? So we see that that SXS is here, and that it filled the critical gap at high X-ray energies that provided first ever spatially resolved spectroscopy in X-rays. But then came April 2016, and Hitomi mission was tragically lost due to uh, human error. But in contrast to its predecessors, Hitomi managed to forever change the landscape of high-resolution X-ray spectroscopy because it observed the core of Perseus cluster, which is shown here. So galaxy clusters are extended source, and so we need the energy-resolving detectors like CCD. So up till 2016, we only had low resolution spectra and example of such spectrum is shown here in blue. And then you can immediately appreciate the difference when a microcarometer is used as the Hitomi spectrum is shown here in black. The spectrum is so rich in information that just this one observation resulted in a number of very important papers. And let me highlight just some of the more interesting results that the Hitomi has obtained. So as shown here in the top central panel, we clearly detected velocity broadening. So we show the data with black points and then the res resolution of the detector is shown as a black solid line un underneath the brightest emission line here. So you can see that you can clearly resolve um, turbulence. In contrast to bright lines, we also looked at weak lines as shown on the top right where the extremely weak emission line from the radiatively inefficient AGN that's in the center of Perseus cluster is shown. So, so otherwise you cannot resolve it because it, it would be buried under the emission from the ICM plasma. Uh, 
but also because we have microparameter data, so we have some spatial information, we could see how emission, this emission line varies pixel to pixel and constrain the size of this neutral circumnuclear disk that's around the black hole uh, for the first time. The bottom panels um, highlight the very rich metal emission lines from many, many ionic stages of many, many elements. And this also includes uh, much less abundant elements such as nickel or manganese that are otherwise extremely hard to, uh, to see. So this tells us a lot about uh, abundances and Hitomi showed that all of these elements in the intercluster medium have solar ratios, which is not something that gradings were able to to tell us uh, during their limitations. Um, of course, we were also able to take advantage of the spatial information in the data. So we were mapping gas motions through Doppler shift and line broadening, uh, as shown on the top. We are also able to use a salary transfer effect because we could really well resolve individual lines. The effect called resonance scattering, um, shown on the bottom left, to directly probe microturbulence. Additionally, as shown at the bottom right, we saw first hints of lines, emission lines that come from charge exchange. So with the neutral H alpha filaments that are embedded within the hot intercluster medium, uh, which is really cool. And when I say we, when we we got to that science, I really mean it. So Kaipak was very much involved uh, with Hitami. And I show here some press releases from Slack and Stanford and a picture of colleagues who are involved, Hiro, Irina, and Norbert, the only one I could find. But of course, there were many, many more people involved. Um, Kaipak also hosted, uh, I think, the only Hitomi Science workshop after the, the mission failure. So this is where we were discussing how to analyze the Perseus spectrum, which is really exciting. So for me, Kaipak was definitely the right place to be involved with Hitomi at the time as a graduate uh, student. So the story of Hitomi is, of course, sad. But as you can see, the depth of results from just a few hour observations is really stark. And so it is clear that the X-ray microparameter science is just too valuable to lose, which is why JAXA and NASA came together again, which result, resulted in the CRISM mission, which stands for X-ray imaging and spectroscopy mission. And CRISM has a much simpler design than Hitomi. It, it is carrying fewer instruments. But critically, it has the powerful microparameter. So here you can see CRISM being assembled in Tsukuba Space Center in Japan on the left. And then on the right, um, you have a um, cartoon that shows the two instruments, the resolved microparameter and the secondary instrument, uh, the extend CCD. So uh, what is the current status of CRISM? Well, I'm happy to announce that CRISM has successfully launched perfectly in time for this meeting. On September 7, Japanese time, which for us in the US was actually last Wednesday. So it's been not even a week that it has been in orbit. Um, I'm also happy to announce that as of just this Monday, we are officially out of the critical operations period, which means that the most important things like power generation for the solar panels, ground communication, attitude control, and so on, are working well. So what happens now? Well, we are now in the commissioning phase, which should hopefully last about three months. So this is where every function of the satellite will be tested, every subsystem will be turned on and, and checked out. And then after that, JAXA will take over um, and then we will enter the performance verification phase or as I think of it, the fun part. So this is when astrophysical targets will be observed and the science team gets to analyze the data. But after that, it will be your turn. So actually right now, it's a great time to start thinking of prison proposals. So nominally, we expect the announcement of opportunity to come out roughly two months after the launch, with cycle one proposals being due roughly five months after the launch. Uh, and to think, uh, to help you think of ideas, let me highlight just a few areas of the PV science. So the areas where prism will be particularly useful. So for example, if you like normal galaxies, but you could barely see them with X-ray CCD, now is the time to propose. So here you can see on the top the simulation of the winds, starburst-driven winds that come out of M82. And um, this includes its hot ISM as well. On the bottom, we have uh, another galaxy cluster because, of course, result is going to be great for galaxy clusters, um, and including studying the AGN and MT. M M87 and how it interacts with the IC ICM in uh, Virgo cluster. 
if you like AG and that are more really efficient than the one in M87, then PRISM will open up studies of very high velocity, very highly ionized winds. It will also be absolutely excellent for studying reflection from the accretion disk, as shown here on the top for MTG6. Another field that will be absolutely transformed by PRISM are supernova remnants, uh, because providing spatially resolved spectroscopy will allow to study shock ejecta, the ISM, measure velocities, abundances um, of these remnants of cosmic explosions. So if you want to learn more about PRISM, just visit the NASA webpage. And yes, there's much more than I was able to cover in this talk. Uh, but now, what about the, the second part of the title of this talk? So let's just spend the few last minutes uh, talking about what lies beyond PRISM, and specifically um, the Line Emission Mapper, or LEM for short, which is a $1 billion emission concept um, that I am a part of the PM, uh, PA team of. Uh, so I'm the assistant deputy PI. Um, so we have been developing LEM in response to NASA's first ever astrophysics probe explorer call. And Sven yesterday in his talk already mentioned this because uh, he's working on a different probe. Um, so LEM provides a massive leap with respect to PRISM. So we're super excited for PRISM. That's going to be amazing. But LEM is just so much more uh, than... than um, prism um, in just about every aspect. So we have a very large half a degree field of view, 15 hour second pixels, one to two EV resolution, which is enabled by transition edge sensors, which can be thought of as next generation microcarometers. And you have uh, Ken or er Erwin at Kepak, so you can ask him about TESs if you want to learn more about the detector. Um, and as a part of the PI led science program, we will perform many pointed observations as well as the first spectroscopic all sky survey and I know there's lots of people at Kaipak who are uh, interested in all sorts of sky surveys um, as we had the session yesterday morning. Uh, but why am I excited about LEM? Um, so in a very, very short explanation, it's because LEM maps the hidden agent of galaxy evolution, the diffuse gas that's inside, around, and between galaxies. With, and it contains all of the messiness uh, that that, uh, that cosmologists complain about, all of those baryonic feedback processes, all of this. It's really critical to, to map this gas to finally get some physical insights. And why do you need specifically LEM for this? Well, first of all, the very high spectral resolution is critical to pierce through, through the Milky Way, which has its own diffuse gas that's all around us and it's shown here in purple. And then for instance, the circumgalactic medium of external galaxies shown in red, can only be resolved from the Milky Way emission if you have high enough spectral resolution. And as you can see, a CCD type de detector shown here in green basically does not stand a chance of, of getting that very weak signal. But LEM is a true IFU, which means that we get images in individual lines. So here we show a CGM of a Milky Way-like galaxy in oxygen and iron. And then we also uh, show the optical extent of the galaxy on the left which shows you that most of the baryons are hidden to us as of now. Um, and I also, th there's much science you can do with these kinds of data. And I list just a few papers we've managed to finish recently on the topic, but we are just starting to scratch the surface. Uh, beyond galactic halos, LEM will also map the intergalactic medium, so the elusive WIM, again, in emission lines. Um, here is where the large field of view and the large effective area are critical. Even this large school structure is strongly affected by physics of galactic feedback processes, and it's just another physical distance scale on which LEM will help uh, probe these baryonic processes. Um, again, many papers to check out if you want to learn more. Um, and finally, LEM will map many, many large structures in the Milky Way very, very up close through pointed observations, but also the first spectroscopic all sky survey. So seeing very up close the supernova remnants, Fermi, Erosita bubbles, super bubbles, galactic chimneys, fountains, and other regions that are affected by stellar and black hole feedback. And this will finally be able, uh, this will finally allow us to understand the galactic ecosystems. So combining those galactic, uh, galactic scales with the cosmic web scales, LEM will address this question on virtually every length scale that's relevant. So I hope you're excited. And also you can check out our website if you want to learn more.
Um, and basically this brings me to my conclusions uh, where I hope you agree with me that we are entering uh, an extra microcurrimeter revolution in x-rays. Um, I also wanna take a moment to share a message of hope uh, to uh, graduate students uh, in the audience. It does look like you can survive your B a PhD blowing up even in space. Although I have to say that to my knowledge, I am the only graduate student who's still in academia, whose thesis was on heat on me. So that's maybe a little bit sad. Um, for the broader Kaipa community, plan on having PRISM team members give you colloquia next fall, next spring. So hopefully we'll have many cool results to share from the actual data and not just simulation. And for those of you who agree that the hot and currently hidden X-ray gas is one of the most exciting from teams of astrophysics, fingers crossed for LEM. Um, and I'm gonna end on a personal note. I am uh, deeply thankful for the time I've spent at PyFact. Um, it was likely one of the best places you could imagine to do your PhD. And I personally took away not just science, but as maybe some of you know, I recently married another KIPAC alumni, uh, Jamie Titus, who was Kent Eros PhD student. Uh, so I think it's safe to say that I will remember KIPAC until the day I die. And with this, I end. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Anna, for that wonderful talk. Um, so if anyone has any questions, um, before I go to the room, just to say to folks on Zoom, you can ask a question by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, but uh, let's open the, the room to questions. Uh, Roger. I, I couldn't have the mic, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, just a quick question. You mentioned sub-EV resolution at the center. Has this been achieved? Yeah. Um, we already demonstrated 1.2 EV in the lab for I forget how many pixels, but this is uh, a very high TRL. Okay, any other questions? Um, I can always take the uh, the chair's prerogative um, and ask them. Um, so you show these um, the the amazing calorimeter spectra, both from Perseus and the the simulations, with just this huge number of different emission and absorption lines from many different components of gas. Um, around AGN, galaxy clusters, galactic halos. What sort of statistical tools do we need to analyze those and understand what's going on? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's gonna be a big awakening for our field. So with PRISM, I think um, we're going to be already challenged with um, you know, multi-dimensional uh, parameter spaces and, and trying to, to you know, find best fits because because many extra astronomers are used to CCD quality data, which you know you only need of the order of 10 parameters to fit. Uh, with LEM-like data, actually, this is really where X-ray and probably any X-ray probe, this is where we're gonna, X-rays are gonna truly enter the, the big data stage of, of the subfield. So we will definitely at that point, we'll be looking to our colleagues uh, from LSST and other kind of massive data uh, kind of subfields and, and how they how, how they dealt with it. So we are with LAM team, we're already looking into machine learning and AI uh, for some of the challenges that we are we're, we are overseeing. But for CRISM, I think it's, it's gonna be mostly about um, optimization and, and choosing um, different, uh, the correct models because CRISM only has 35 pixels, which is easier to handle than 14,000 for, for, for sure. <laughs>